Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Friday's live stream. Uh, today, quite interesting news. I think uh, there is a little bit of uh, price appreciation, a little bit sludge coming back and forth. But the thing that concerns me or actually could be uh, the next thing for a bull run is this little piece that came out today. It looks like the big banks are fomoing. And at first glance, you would look at this and go, this is fantastic news. But just stick with me because I think there's problems on the horizon. But here's what we got. So big banks are nudging the SEC for a slice, I like this, for a slice of sweet Bitcoin ETF action. And I have to tell you right now, for the ETF action, it's uh, there's nobody else to, to really do it better. Then first of all, James from Invest Answers is doing a great job of tracking all the portfolios, but also uh, BitMEX Research. And they put out uh, this little data graph, which takes a look at just how well the ETFs are doing. And I don't know if you knew this, but uh, we are outpacing the gold ETFs by a major amount. And there's between 7 and 14x demand for ETFs, as opposed to what's actually being produced every day, which is 900 Bitcoin per day. And we just see that uh, we are actually, this is from the 15th, today is the 16th. I can't get the daily uh, updates until everything gets uh, closed. But uh, right now we're up 96,511 uh, Bitcoin, even though we've got uh, quite a bit of a dump for Grayscale. So what does this mean for, for banks? That's what it means for banks. Banks are like this. They're like, hey, we want a piece of that sweet action. And uh, we can't believe we can't get into it because the people that we trusted, Gary and the SEC, uh, didn't look out after us. So this was actually a letter that uh, they put out. This is from the American Bankers Association, the Bank Policy Institute, Financial Services Forum, and SIFMA. And they state this. And of course, I love to read these things just to, just to see just how much FOMO it is. And they say this, we are writing to request that the, the SEC considers targeted modifications to Staff Accounting Bulletin number 121. And again, I like to see uh, <laughs> exactly what is actually said to the SEC and where things are going. And uh, this is quite interesting. It says there have been uh, several relevant developments during this two-year period including the, G the GAO report issued in October, or GAO, approval of certain spot Bitcoin ETPs, and the SEC's proposed ruling on safeguarding advisory client assets that would cover the custody of digital assets if finalized as proposed. So they're saying here essentially is like, look, this is what we see to be happening. For some reason, we weren't included. And then coming down here, this is their two big gripes, which I, I, I honestly have to say, I can understand why they would be uh, not too happy about this because they pretty much got aced out because essentially what happened was Coinbase stepped in and go, you know what, we'll be the custody service provider because we can do it and you guys can't because of the laws that were passed to protect everybody. So even though we got, uh, even though Coinbase got sued by the SEC, they actually are a beneficiary of the laws that were passed, not by the SEC, because SEC, they only enforce laws, but the laws that were passed by Congress and the SEC is enforcing. So here we go. So they say this, they like, look, spot Bitcoin ETPs. The commission recently approved 11 spot Bitcoin ETPs, allowing investors access to this asset class through a regulated product. However, notably absent from those approved products are banking organizations. Let me say that again. Notably absent from those approved products are banking organizations serving as the asset custodian a role they regularly play for most ETPs. Essentially, they're saying this. Look, we're running out of funds. We have some bank collapses. We're actually shutting down the brick and mortar stores across the globe because they're not really needed as much. So we'd like to have a sweet piece of this action and it looks like we're being aced out. So if you could just kind of change the rules or kind of overlook some things or not be stringent, maybe we could do better. To finish up, these ETPs have already experienced billions of dollars in inflows, but it's practically impossible for banks to service custodians for these ETPs at scale due to the tier one capital ratio and the reserve and capital requirements that result from the laws that were passed, SAB 121. And then they also say on top of this, they say, look, the use of distributed ledger technology to record traditional financial assets is also something that we can't get into. Banking organizations are increasingly exploring the use of distributed ledger technology to record traditional financial assets, such as bonds. The use of DLT has the potential to expedite and automate payment, clearing, reconciliation, and settlement services. And multiple central banks outside the US are partnering with banks to explore the adoption of DLT. And the reason why it's outside the United States 
is because the SEC is overstepping their boundaries. And we've talked about this many times on the show. When you have enforcement through regulation, you have problems because essentially the SEC is going, we are going to stifle innovation and we're going to step in the on the throats essentially of, of the progress that we could potentially make. Now, when that happens, what does it create? It creates a vacuum. Then, of course, everybody everything can go across outside the states to other countries that are friendly to crypto. And, of course, we get passed up. Why was this allowed? Well, it's because the people that were in charge. And there's nobody else to blame but the people that are that are above in those positions. So, again... Uh, there's a reason why the SEC is doing what they're doing. But there's also a reason why they keep losing in these court cases. So uh, thank you, Ripple. And then to finish this up, uh, however, SAB 121 has proven to be a barrier to banking organizations' ability to meaningfully engage in DLT-based products due to the breadth of the definition of crypto assets in SAB 121. And then there's some more information here, but it gets pretty dry. So I'm just going to... Leave it up to you. I linked this in the description. You can check it out for yourself. But here's the concern to me. And we talked about this a couple of times. There's a way things that should be and the way that things are going to be. And the way things that should be is that we should all use some type of cold storage device because it's not hard. It's not hard to essentially be your own bank. It's very simple, especially with Tangem. You can use Ledger or Alipal. It doesn't matter to me. But uh, for people to use this, it's actually quite simple. They just don't want to take the extra step and learn new things because they're so indoctrinated to actually use the banks. What will probably happen is the banks will start to custody Bitcoin and crypto and other digital assets for everybody else because they think that that's the ones to actually put it there. Then what's going to happen is we're going to have some type of fractional reserve or some kind of fractional reserve lending, just like what they do with the money that you put in there. For every dollar that you put in, or excuse me, for every $100 they put in, it's between $97, $99 that they can actually lend out. And then you just have a massive amount of, of these digital assets that were finite, now become lent out, and there's a problem there. So I see this as an issue moving forward for other people, not for us, because we understand the limitations of what is happening in the traditional markets. So I think this is just... It's great for FOMO and it's great for stories and it's great to push the narrative of the bull run. I'm just kind of shuddered to think about what's going to happen in the future, especially with people allowing banks to custody. Anyhow, I could be wrong and I don't really mind if people want to do it that way. Everybody's different. I just think that we're not that stupid and we can learn how to do it ourselves. Anyhow, let me just think about that in the comments section. And then to finish up, because uh, pretty quick day, I want to do a little Q&A, is uh, this was a good piece. I'm going to break two rules today. I'm going to break two rules today. And uh, actually, it's the same rule for two projects. And the rule is that I don't talk about things unless I own them. I don't own any Aptos. But I thought this was very interesting. And it's just a, it's just a, it's just a interesting piece. Aptos joins crypto smartphone race with Jumbo Phone partnership. And this is what we got. I always like to see, you know, real world, uh, functionality, especially uh, from throughout other countries. Here's what we have. There's a collaboration. The collaboration that's going on will build on the launch of the Jumbo phone, which is a it's a, a smartphone that's less than 100 bucks. It's pretty good. $99 smartphone that's designed to unlock the digital economy for users in Africa, Southeast Asia, and Latin America. That's a major bulk of people throughout the world. We're sitting at like, I think around 8.1 billion people in the world correcting the comment section. So if you're talking about Africa, Southeast Asia, and Latin America, that's billions right there. This was launched in January and available in more than 40 countries. The Jumbo phone comes bundled with pre-installed applications, including Aptos compatible wallet Petra. Now, I found this great. This is good for Aptos. If you own Aptos, I'm sure you're rejoicing. I'm glad for you. I'm happy for you. But just remember, there's a lot of apps that come with your phone when you buy your phone. Do you use all of those apps? Potentially. And I'm just saying this is great for Aptos because, you know, the more things that you can get out there, because if, you, if, you, if you're talking about cost per acquisition, like a CPA numbers, that's the hardest part in any business. It costs a lot of money to get customers. If you can just be on a phone and you have your access to billions of people, <laughs> congratulations, you just won a major war. So the pre-installed Jumbo app offers a comprehensive introduction to Web3. That's fantastic. That's good for the markets. I like that. 
through its Jumbo Earn and Jumbo Academy educational suites, with Jumbo promising to offer income opportunities through the app's quests feature, which is what you're kind of seeing right now with the airdrop. So again, I don't own uh, any Aptos, but I know people love it. And uh, we'll see uh, how that turns out. But I think that's uh, positive for the market. I'm happy for that. So there I'm breaking my rule. I talked about something I don't own. Now I'm going to talk about another thing I don't own. Well, actually, I do own this. Uh, World Mobile. So we've we've talked about this on the channel every so often. We need to do another dive with uh, with uh, Mickey Watkins to come in here, the founder or co-founder of uh, World Mobile. But again, it's uh, bringing telecommunications to different parts of the world that uh, is underserved and underutilized, especially with different places that you cannot get service as far as uh, talk, text, and data uh, throughout these different areas. And uh, of course, it's it's actual real world uh, infrastructure. I, to me, I think this is like one of the first deep ends, the first decentralized physical infrastructure network would be World Mobile Token. And they, they proved this in uh, Zanzibar. Anyhow, so I was actually talking to Mickey over on, uh, on what were we? Was the, not text message, it was one of the mobile apps. I forgot, there's so many out there. And he goes, hey, just so you know, uh, we're bringing, out, bringing to market, uh, we're partnering up with uh, Minutes. And Minutes is gonna help us with the um, uh, calling procedures. Essentially, what it, what it comes down to is this, is did you know that there is a market for calls, international and, and domestic calls? Like when, you, when I call you on my phone, apparently it's a $250 billion industry and it's gonna, well, that's what it's supposed to be projected in 2024. I think it's like 247 billion for this year, gonna cross over 250 in 2024. And what they're trying to, looking to do is World Mobile and this company, Minutes, are looking to disrupt the whole industry. I did not know this until I was talking to Mickey and, and Josh, who's the founder of uh, Minutes Network. This is what happens. When you make a call, essentially right here, this is the caller, the person on the other side, that's the receiver. In the middle, there's a bunch of these, these third-party processors, and essentially they take a cut of everything from like Verizon and T-Mobile and everything else, and it gets expensive. And what these guys gonna, are gonna do essentially is they're gonna disrupt the whole market and they're going to actually put a couple of lines of code in different apps that you, normal everyday apps that you would see on your phone, and it's gonna cut everything down by like 80%. Essentially, it's going to cut out the middlemen and you're gonna be able to get paid with that in the token itself. Now, I will just say this, this is a very new company and uh, I've heard, rumblings that uh, they've, this is just hearsay, that they've already inked a deal with a company with 1.2 billion users. Don't uh, get too excited until that actually comes out, but they're already doing it. There's an Explorer and they've already got incoming calls, 23,000 right now. I mean, this is like a thing that actually works right now. And I'm just uh, interested in it. I'm gonna do a deep dive on it, but to me, it's all about the Goldilocks zone. Cause I think well, this is actually proven. Around this time for, around the halving, is when some pretty big projects usually get up and running. You got Shiba in August 2020, San in 2020, Gala, AVAX, Axie, Solana, Matic, and yeah, Luna was in July 2019. That was, of course, right before, actually, no, excuse me, that was right after the halving, matter of fact. And uh, yeah, it did collapse, but I mean, a lot of people made a fortune on that thing. So I'm always looking for the next the next thing that's out there, but it's risky. But uh, if this proves to be what it is, it could be pretty big. That's it for today. So I can't give too many more details because I can't really talk about it. But that's it for right now. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. Maybe talk about it's time sensitive.